Hello and welcome to the Health Research Report, or I should say video of the Health Research Report this January 3rd, 2014, so we can date this segment. And to start off with, we'll start with our old friend, Vitamin E, which is ironic if you come to think about it because it was just out last week. Uh, they said that vitamins don't make a difference in the diet one way or the other, no clinical benefit proven, da 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 da. Well, obviously, we know uh, from those of us in the industry that that's totally fabricated, I should say. They're literally fabricated. Because there is just monuments of data out there supporting the use of nutrients when it comes to basic health and disease prevention. Now you can argue what the optimum dose of a nutrient is, or you can argue what optimum health is. Of course today, no one really cares whether you could run around a block or even walk around a block as long as your cholesterol, blood pressure, and so on and so forth are all kept in check on a chart because you're more than a group of numbers. But I digress. Now back to vitamin E. Now what this was an article published in the January 1st edition of the Journal of American Medical Association. What they looked at was Alzheimer's disease, and basically moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease. And what they utilized was alpha tocopherol, which is only one isomer, a one part of eight parts of vitamin E. So people don't realize there's actually eight parts, alpha, beta, delta, gamma, tocopherols, and tocopherols. But they only took one part, and they gave 2,000 IUs, which sounds like a lot when you look at your typical recommended daily allowance which we don't know what that was based upon, but obviously far below 2,000 IUs. And when they administered to individuals with Alzheimer's disease, they ended up with an increase in life expectancy of six and a half months. But that's not the main meat of the article. Now we look at the article, they compared it to a placebo, and they compared it to the drug prescribed for Alzheimer's disease called memantine. Now the irony here is, only the vitamin E showed, in their words, clinical benefit in this trial. Against the placebo, obviously, no effect, and probably the fairly expensive medication that's prescribed for it. Interesting, if you think about it, vitamin E surpassed it. But the true benefit to it comes from independence given to individuals who are taking it that has Alzheimer's disease. And it said at the bottom of the study that basically each individual required two hours less of a caregiver's time, which is important when it comes to dignity and basically being able to function on your own independently. So again, January 1st edition, 2014, the Journal of American Medical Association, they showed 2000 IUs of vitamin E had clear clinical benefit in regards to life expectancy and reduction of time required by caregivers. So, something definitely to consider if unfortunately you're in that position where you know someone that's in that position. After that, an article, whoop, title's cut off. Article well, actually says, review most clinical studies on vitamins flawed by poor methodology. And what they basically came out with, and this was published in the December 30th, it may actually be the January edition now of the Journal of Nutrients. Again, published in the Journal of Nutrients. I like peer-reviewed stuff and I like to see stuff that has data where other individuals can look at it. Hence, peer review. All right, they discovered that most of the researchers who are researching vitamins, number one, do not understand how micronutrients work. They try to give it the same aspects as a medication or drug. They want to see a cure, they want to see a cure now. Now realizing that it's a lot of vitamin deficiencies that result in disease. Not the fact that they're designed to cure, they're designed to prevent. You'd be like me saying oil for a car engine is not required because it shows no clear benefit. But anybody that drives a car recognizes that oil for that engine prevents the engine from breaking down. It's not going to fix it after the fact, but it may actually help it from ever occurring. Hence micronutrients in the human body. What they discovered was a couple of things. One is the researchers don't have a baseline. And the problem with that having a baseline, because each person's nutrient levels in the blood is going to vary, you can't determine who's it going to benefit and who's not going to benefit. 
Obviously, the nutrients are going to benefit those people with deficiencies the most because obviously they have the least amount of oil in the engine and the parts are kind of wearing down. But the cool part about this article and a few things I discovered was when they went to go look at the baseline, how I should say disadvantaged the diets of most individuals are. And how disadvantaged, you may say? Well, let's look at this. More than 90% of the U.S. adults do not get the required amounts of vitamin D and vitamin E for basic health. We're talking basic health, not optimal health. More than 40% don't get enough vitamin C. Considering the, the RDA of vitamin C is what, 60 milligrams? You practically have to be avoiding it. And half aren't getting enough vitamin A, calcium, and magnesium. Prior from not eating the vegetables whatsoever. So generally you have a population which at minimal is 90% deficient in nutrients. So how do you draw a good study based upon that? That was the issue that we're trying to big, bring up in the Journal of Nutrition. They also said too, this is interesting, so if I skip ahead a little bit. Even though the such studies often significantly understate the value of vitamin supplements, the largest and longest clinical trial of multivitamin mineral supplements found a reduction, I should say a total reduction, of cancer and cataract incidents in male physicians over the age of 50. It suggested that if every adult in the U.S. took such supplements, I'm talking a simple multivitamin, it would prevent up to 130,000 cases of cancer each year. Which ironically, how are we going to treat those 130,000 cases of each year of cancer which are occurring? Not with the micronutrients, we're going to treat them with chemo. Because looking at the cause is not as effective as trying to cure it after the fact. And that's my big beef also with a lot of the cancer societies out there, or cancer charities. None of them want to prevent you from getting cancer, or they're waiting to cure it. But it'd be so much easier just to make sure people didn't get it to begin with. So, henceforth, the authors suggest it'd be foolish to suggest that a multivitamin which costs less than a nickel a day is a bad idea. Click back. One and a half weeks ago, they did say vitamins don't make a difference, but yet it doesn't seem to correlate with data, but it sells headlines. So again, that came out of the Journal of Nutrition. And after that, we will go to alcohol, especially after New Year's Day. Might as well bring it up now. What happened was this, this uh, I should say, lecturer or teacher at the National Poly Institute in uh, Polytechnic Institute in Mexico, sorry, noticed his students were coming back a little inebriated on Monday morning. I should say not inebriated, but had a pretty strong hangover from being inebriated. So through serendipity, he decided to do a study on the oxidative stress of alcohol. Well, what they discovered when the class took part in this, and this is interesting, is that alcohol resulted in double the oxidative stress, which means you kind of look in layman's terms, uh, damages you twice as fast, maybe age you twice as fast. But here's where it gets really interesting, which is a surprise to both of them. They were surprised by the results. So they wanted to look at the DNA in regards to alcohol also at the same time too. And remember, the students who drank in this, according to this, was about a liter and a half or 118 grams of alcohol over a weekend, just one weekend. And within that group, not just the oxidative damage, they decided to continue to assess whether the DNA was also affected. And basically what they looked, did was look and see what's called the chromatin is not properly compacted. If the DNA has been damaged, it leaves what's called an electrophoresis. I apologize for mispronounced that, or otherwise known as a comet tail. And in actual fact, the chromatin of the exposed group did leave a small halo or tail, greater than that of control group. The interesting part about it, without getting too technical, is the general control group, which did not drink, only had about 8% damage to their cells over a typical weekend. The group that did drink that liter and a half per weekend had 44% of their cells damaged. Therefore, the exposed group had 5.3 
times more damaged cells than the other group. So, if you're going to drink, that's fine. you got to enjoy life. But you got to recognize if you drink too much, especially straight alcohol, there is going to be a price to pay. And if you're one of these groups that drink, don't do vitamins, or eat well, you're going to be exposed to a lot more than just 44% of your cells being damaged. Well, that's it for the January 3rd, 2014 video edition of the Health Research Report. And again, I'll kick out another one within seven to eight days and hopefully make it a little bit more interesting each time. All right, guys, catch us in a bit.